Welcome to another session of uh, WSO2 EI webinar series. Today's our topic is uh, API centric hybrid integration platform for microservices or ESP style architecture. Let's look at the agenda first. So first, uh, we are going to talk about uh, what application enterprise application integration in general. And then uh, we go ahead and talk about hybrid integration specifically. And then we are gonna talk about API driven integration, which is one of the uh, popular integration approach today. And also finally, we are gonna talk about application integration architectures. So to begin with, let's try to understand uh, what is mean by uh, app enterprise application integration. So if you take any business today, business digitalization plays an important role for it to become successful. So it helps you to gain competitive advantage, business enhancement, scaling and reduce cost. So a typical enterprise is comprised of different uh, IT assets, like uh, it has different software elements like CRP systems, ERP systems, HR systems. If they are not linked, it, they can lead to inefficiencies in your business. So we generally call them information silos because they are not uh, connected to each other. So what business digitalization try to do is linking those individual information silos together to deliver useful business functionalities for your customers and other partners of your business. Famous research firm from firm Gartner describes app enterprise application integration as exchanging of processes and data among different enterprise applications. So let's see what are the elements of a enterprise application integration. There are different ways you can do application integration. Say uh, if you, uh, you have several uh, enterprise applications that are not linked to each other and you try to unify them from the user interface and try to uh, bring more functionalities, we call it uh, integration at presentation level. Sometimes uh, most of the business uh, has uh, some logical workflow you can uh, try to map your workflow in your business uh, to different components and try to integrate them. We call it uh, business process integration. Different components in your enterprise uh, can have different uh, data in different formats. And obviously when you uh, try to integrate them, you need to transform and transfer data between the uh, information uh, silos. The, that means uh, in enterprise uh, applications. So that is called data integration. So uh, when these components communicate with each other, they can communicate with different protocols, especially if the uh, applications are legacy. So they may also come from different uh, messaging paradigms like uh, synchronous messaging versus uh, asynchronous messaging. So sometimes you need to combine these uh, uh, applications. So we call that communication level integration. So it is obvious that application integration can be done at different levels. So now let's see uh, how application uh, integration can be done. 
So there are like popular styles to do the application integration. So one, one of the most popular way is the bus style. All applications get connected to a central bus and the integration is looked after by that middleware layer. Whereas in microservices architecture, uh, which is a better way of implementing service oriented architecture, you, uh, your integration logic is spread up to small, small services and that gives you much more ability to uh, scale independently and much more flexibility. So we'll talk about these uh, architectures later in this webinar. So, uh, so when you do an application integration, different parties need to communicate with each other. So the different parties means uh, different applications. So when they communicate with each other, they need to agree on a common protocol and a common message format. So this agreement on how to communicate, we can call it an API. So if it is, uh, if the communication is done through HTTP, we, we can use REST API, but it is not necessarily to be REST, any defined agreement on how to call the functionalities of an application can be considered as an API. Now let's move on to hybrid integration. So we have an idea about what enterprise application integration now. Uh, so we'll specifically see uh, what hybrid integration means. So if you look at the Gartner definition on hybrid integration, so it specified the elements uh, that uh, specific platform need to fulfill to become a hybrid integration platform. So specifically, it needs to integrate on-premise and cloud-based applications together. And also uh, different people, or we call them personas, uh, using the HIP platform uh, from uh, integration specialists to citizen integrators, that means your business users uh, can get benefited from that platform. So, so uh, if you look at it in detail, so uh, if you take a particular business today, it has partners, customers, suppliers, and even mobile users. So IT components delivering services to this each party needs to be uh, integrated together to deliver a much more functionality and be uh, competitive with the other enterprise enterprises. So the challenge is uh, when you try to integrate these uh, individual business component, they deal with different data formats and they, different data protocols. So integrating these together, together we call this uh, call that pervasive integration. When you integrate, you need to integrate them securely as well. So in short a system or a platform or a collection of integration technologies to securely interconnect IT components, delivering business functionalities is called a hybrid integration platform. So, uh, so let's see like why it is called hybrid. So it is called a hybrid as it is integrating, as it is integrating on-premise and cloud systems together. So when, uh, when we say on-premise data, or any enterprise will have its own data on the, on the corporate databases, there are their houses, and they might be also running uh, some servers with their in-house applications. Sometimes uh, the enterprise has legacy systems uh, where, uh, uh, but you might have an action items in your digital strategy to integrate with them, uh, with these legacy systems, with other applications. So all these, uh, we call them all together on-premise 
uh, data or the applications uh, which are within the firewall of your enterprise. So apart from that, there are cloud applications. There's a vast variety of them because uh, there are uh, uh, a lot of boom in the cloud era now. So uh, there are ERP systems like, like NetSuite, by Oracle, Workday, Microsoft Dynamics 365. There are content management systems like Amazon S3. Uh, Gmail is a popular email service. There are B2B applications, business to business applications like uh, Electronic Data Exchange, ETI. Uh, CRM systems are there like Salesforce, very popular. Uh, there are also bring your own device that means enterprise mobile platforms and analytics applications so what a hybrid uh, integration platform does is bridging or integrating on-premise and these cloud applications together uh, so the system can deliver a wide variety of services to its uh, stakeholders So uh, let's see why we need hybrid integration. And so obviously uh, the, the obvious reason for the need of HIP platform is the business growth uh, and how people access the business today. So it's a combination of local, mobile and cloud apps. It's not just only local. So we cannot drop any of these uh, because I, address different uh, segments of the market so uh, so for a successful business what we need to do is uh, integrate these assets together to build uh, an ecosystem so it will lead to competitive advantage over the other enterprises So far, we discussed what is meant by application integration in general, and we also described what uh, what is meant by hybrid integration in specific. So let's see uh, how WSO2 can help you here. So uh, WSO2 uh, has a has an integration solution. We call it a WSO2 Enterprise Integrator. So there's uh, two series, like six and seven series. Uh, so we will describe later what is the difference, but uh, both of them has all the elements. Both of the series has all the elements needed to construct or implement a hybrid integration platform. Uh, so when it comes to data services, uh, WSO2 EI comes with data services. That means uh, it has the capability to expose your uh, enterprise data. Uh, it can be uh, any type of database, uh, SQL or non-SQL, as an API. So that is uh, data services. And also it has the capability to connect with popular brokers like uh, ActiveMQ and RobinMQ and even the streaming-based uh, uh, brokers like Kafka and also cloud-based messaging systems like uh, Amazon SQS. And also it has a business uh, process integration. So you can map your model, your business flow uh, using WSO2 EI. Uh, for data transformation, uh, WSO2 EI has rich capabilities. You can use data mapper or mediators like XSLT or script mediators. Uh, you can transfer data between XML, JSON, CSV, or text, etc. Uh, and it has a wide variety of protocol support as well. So you can bridge uh, different uh, or integrate different uh, applications communicating with different protocols and I want to highlight uh, the connectors here so uh, connectors uh, are uh, not coming with WSO2 EI out of the box uh, so they are extensions to the WSO2 EI runtime so they are used uh, when you need to call 
cloud applications from uh, WS3 AI. So uh, when you use connectors, what you can do is uh, you can go to the connector store. So we have uh, a lot of connectors. They are addressed in different uh, areas in uh, enterprise. Uh, and uh, you, can, you can download uh, what is required and also view the documentation that you use to build your integration logic. So uh, when I talk about building integration logic, we have a special tool or Eclipse based editor to write the integration logic, uh, which is uh, configuration based. You can drag and drop uh, the logic elements onto the canvas and build your integration logic. Uh, so, uh, so it has mediators for data transformation, uh, on the top of these base capabilities, uh, you can uh, import the necessary connectors onto WSO2 uh, Integration Studio project and uh, use that. So you don't need to go separately to the store and download. So all the integrated capabilities are with the editor itself. So here, an, uh, here is an example uh, how to use a connector. So uh, let me briefly go over the scenario we are trying to, we were trying to build here. Uh, so say uh, you have some, some on-premise uh, data in the uh, enterprise and you need to store those data onto uh, Amazon S3 bucket. Uh, so what you can do is uh, here we have created the REST API in the first resource uh, when it is in not a bucket is created on the S3 side you can initialize the connector using the init operation giving correct credentials to connect to S3 and then create the uh, Amazon S3 bucket and then uh, in the next resource, when you uh, invoke that API, API resource, it will uh, store whatever the message onto the uh, bucket that is being created. So, uh, so, so if you uh, look at the left side of this uh, panel, you will see a uh, different op operations supported by this connector is listed. You can drag and drop uh, required operations to the canvas and build your integration logic. So uh, at the same time, the, uh, the XML based configurations will be generated back end. So we talk about uh, application integration and HIP platform. Um, so in, in, in the previous slide also, we mentioned about the APIs. Uh, APIs. Uh, cloud applications uh, are also heavily communicated to the APIs. So let's dive into APIs now. So let me uh, call upon my colleague uh, Dinesha to continue on webinar from uh, now on, over to you, Dinesha. So, uh, thank you, Hasita. So, uh, uh, so let's just uh, discuss uh, the importance and uh, the need to use APIs and uh, also uh, the benefits of being API driven uh, for a business uh, from this point on. So uh, let's first see what uh, exactly is uh, the role of APIs when it comes to integration. Right? So, um, so if we uh, look at uh, uh, the modern day businesses and applications, they are increasingly rely uh, on uh, as a service offerings. For, for an example, we think we can think of uh, SaaS. Right? 
So APIs play a crucial role in these uh, kinds of platforms. Uh, and also, uh, you may be hearing uh, the buzzword, uh, integration agile often. So uh, this integration agile means uh, the integration system should be able to adapt uh, for frequent business changes. Uh, so basically an API is an enabler for integration agile. So uh, as I mentioned before, uh, APIs have become a key enabler for the digital enterprise. Right? Uh, and um, also uh, APIs also act as uh, gateways for enterprise digital assets and uh, and uh, by doing that they are they allow the enterprise to uh, quickly build new digital consumer experiences right so those are actually uh, one of the key benefits of using an api right and uh, apis also have uh, the ability to uh, open up new revenue channels and also expand uh, uh the existing revenue channels uh, an organization has so this involves uh, monetizing apis and uh, we are going to talk about uh, those managing apis in in our future uh in, in the future so uh, ultimately uh, uh another benefit of having an api is uh, the api uh, enable uh, apis enable the enterprise to cater to future expansions as well so it is some kind of a an, an extension point So uh, before we proceed with uh, the API-driven approach, let us quickly see what is meant by uh, digitalization of businesses. Right? So uh, uh, this world is becoming digitized. So when you write a program, you need to ensure that uh, your code, uh, you code your services, uh, uh, you code your services once, and it can be distributed to every digital channel you need. Right? So uh, in the modern world, we should understand that uh, the components of a business are no longer standalone. So in modern businesses, it is uh, very important that uh, users, uh, consumers, suppliers, as well as uh, partners should be able to interact through a common platform. So to do that, uh, the communication between those business components should happen through well-defined interfaces. Right? So the, if you look at this diagram, it shows how these components are structured. You can see the business ecosystem and uh, the APIs are layered across the business model through this uh, diagram. So now let's see how important APIs are. So this famous company, Apple, they trademarked their slogan, uh, there's an app for that. So. Uh, but uh, with almost every organization from every industry going through digital trans transformation journeys, uh, I think it's, I think uh, a better catchphrase, uh, catchphrase would be uh, there's an API for that. Right? So uh, as we mentioned earlier, mm. an API is uh, sort of a contract uh, put out for the application programmer to interact with another system using his application. So uh, there are several types of uh, uh, APIs available and uh, let us quickly see what are those types. So there are open APIs uh, and open API basically provides uh, open access to data without requiring any authentication. So a good example would be uh, government organizations. Uh, they can make information publicly available to citizens through open APIs. Right? And uh, the second type is uh, public APIs. So uh, public APIs, uh, they just opens uh, a set of selected services only to a specific set of authorized developers. So this way, uh, organizations can share and receive data beyond their boundaries in an authorized way. So uh, the next type is uh, private APIs. So private APIs are used uh, within an organization by their developers uh, to integrate and uh, basically leverage their uh, own systems and applications and also to share information within that organization. And uh, another type is uh, the internal APIs. So internal APIs are basically used only within a specific system. 
So the easiest example is uh, the communication between uh, the front end and the back end of a system. So the communication happens through internal APIs. So uh, next we are going to talk about uh, what, what, it meant, what it means to be uh, API centric. So uh, just uh, before talking about this, let me just take an example. So uh, just uh, take Uber for an example. Right? So Uber, they, they are like highly dependent on APIs for their like uh, several functionalities. Uh, they have uh, these map, uh, maps-based tracking systems and also they have this mobile payments platform, uh, things like that. Uh, those, all of those platforms are uh, leveraging various APIs. So this Uber is uh, a company which is uh, basically API centric. Right? Uh, also another example of, uh, you know, uh, of this being API centric is uh, most of the marketing departments we have in our organizations. Right? So most marketers have um, a whole suite of tools they use. Uh, for an example, CRM platforms, ERP platforms, email uh, and marketing tools analytics tools, things like that, right? So um, so through APIs, the marketing team is able to create a stack, right? So this basically enables that particular organization to leverage all uh, of the best point solutions in, um, in uh, like across all teams. Right? So uh, that is the, the API centric approach. So uh, when developing APIs, right, uh, basically there are two key uh, approaches uh, in the world today. So uh, those two approaches are integration first approach and the API design first approach. Right? So let's just uh, talk about them uh, briefly. So uh, if you take the integration first approach, this is the mo uh, most uh, traditional uh, approach we, we uh, could see like throughout the uh, throughout uh, the, also uh, the legacy applications. So uh, in, in in that, what happens is uh, first we uh, develop the backend of that particular system, right? Uh, then what uh, we do is then we develop the API to expose the services uh, from that backend to the outside world, right? Then ultimately we develop uh, the front end of that application or uh, the presentation layer of that application. So this is the code uh, integration first approach. So this approach is also known as the code first approach. And uh, so this is the most common approach uh, we see in most of uh, our existing systems. And the next approach is uh, the API design first approach. So in this approach, what we do is uh, the front end developers or uh, the presentation layer developers, they basically design the API first before de designing uh, the backend or the front end. So they design the API first, then they design uh, the backend of the application. Right? So um, uh, it can be sometimes the front end also, because uh, since we have the API, we can design one of them. Uh, so uh, then ultimately you can design uh, front end or the back end of the application. So here the API layer is uh, designed first. So this is the API design first approach. So those are the two key approaches we have in uh, API design. So uh, uh, let's just talk more about this being API centric concept. So uh, today we live in an API economy. So they, uh, according to Gartner, uh, it is like that. So uh, what, is, uh, what is meant by API economy? So basically it is uh, API economies, uh, the exposure of an organization's digital services and assets uh, through APIs in a controlled way. So uh, here you have to understand that APIs alone uh, do not bring value, but you need integration as well. So basically, this uh, the API economy is uh, sort of an enabler for uh, turning a business or uh, any organization into a platform. Right? So platforms basically multiply values, uh, multiply value creation, uh, because um, 
they uh, enable business ecosystems inside and outside of the enterprise to uh, consummate uh, matches among users and uh, also facilitate the creation uh, uh, or the exchange of goods, uh, services, and so on. So this is done to basically capture the value of those goods, services, and So next, we are going to talk about uh, the API management. So, so far, uh, we talked about the importance of APIs and also the API-centric approach. So uh, now let's see how we can manage these APIs in the real world. API management uh, involves in designing, publishing, and uh, documenting, and also analyzing APIs. So for any organization, it is uh, paramount uh, to have an API management system uh, because uh, it, it, could, it could guarantee uh, the, the, the APIs being created are consumable as well as secure. So uh, API management systems also give the ability to monetize your APIs by uh, selling them to consumers. So let's see what uh, WSO2 offers uh, to uh, manage APIs. So WSO2 has uh, this uh, product called the API Manager. So uh, it's, uh, it, it is a great example of an API management system. And also currently, it is one of the uh, top, ranked, uh, top ranked open source API management solutions in the world. So uh, the WSO2 API Manager has features um, uh, such as this. So, uh, for uh, the, the features of API Manager involves in API designing, and also it has uh, uh, an API gateway, uh, an API store, and also analy analytics capabilities to uh, monitor your APIs. Okay. So, in the design phase, you, you have uh, the API publisher, and also the API developer uh, portal, uh, where you can. Uh, uh, develop your APIs, right? And also, as a run, uh, in the runtime, it provides it uh, pro provides the uh, API gateway and also uh, the API micro gateway, uh, and also it has a key manager for uh, security purposes, and also it has a traffic manager for basically API throttling and uh, things like that, and ultimately uh, the analytics features. Um, and also, uh, there are some more features provided by the API manager, the WSO2 API manager. Uh, it is actually comprised with a cloud-native API gateway. It also provides um, a Kubernetes operator, uh, which you can use to uh, convert your raw microservices into managed APIs. Right? Um, and also, uh, the API manager integrates with uh, service meshes and uh, it provides a full-fledged management plane and also uh, and, and a control plane for managing, uh, monitoring, and monetizing uh, your APIs and your API-based products. Uh, it also provides uh, granular access, uh, granular access control uh, features. Uh, so you can just uh, uh, do things like uh, implement your security uh, aspects down to the API level. So, uh, so far we have talked about integration, uh, hybrid integration, and as well as API integration. So in the next section of this webinar, uh, we are going to talk about uh, commonly used integration architectures or uh, integration patterns. So uh, before we discuss integration architectures, uh, let us see what are the characteristics of a good integration. So uh, one key factor to identify here is the loose coupling between applications. So what is basically coupling? Coupling means, uh, it, 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 a cu uh, coupling defines the degree to which components of a system depend on one another. So uh, loosely coupling, like loosely coupling your components provides more uh, independent components. So uh, having what is the benefit of having more uh, like independent components? 
So if you do some change in one component, the other components will have uh, very minimal or minimal to none if, uh, effect on them. And also another good characteristic is uh, having less amount of integration code. So if a developer has to uh, develop a sophisticated or a very complex integration scenario, uh, it would be uh, a headache to write like hundreds of uh, integration code in order to execute that particular integration flow, right? So if, you, uh, if your integration solution provides uh, uh, the ability to write the integration flows using less amount of code, then that is definitely a good characteristic of a good integration. Um, and also uh, the next key point is the reliability of communication. So uh, basically uh, a good integration should ensure the communication between applications uh, is reliable. So the, the, uh, the reliability factor should be there. Also uh, a good integration should be able to uh, change based on business requirements. So uh, see it's a fast moving world. So business requirements can change rapidly and become more uh, complex. So to cater to these requirements, any integration should be flexible enough to change on demand. So knowing what a good integration looks like, let's see what are the most popular integration styles or architectures uh, available today. So one of the most commonly used integration styles is the ESP architecture. So ESP stands for Enterprise Service Bus. In the ESP architecture, applications are integrated together over a bus-like infrastructure. So the ESP becomes the communication bus or the communication hub, and the applications talk to the bus instead of talking to each other uh, application, each, each others uh, directly. So this way, the applications are decoupled from each other uh, so that is definitely a good characteristic uh, of a good integration. So uh, the WSO2 Ent uh, Enterprise Service Bus provides this capability. So the next uh, popular ar architecture we are going to talk about is the microservices architecture. So the, the microservices architecture is becoming popular and it's, uh, it's rapidly being uh, adopted by many organizations. So in this architecture, uh, a system is developed as an uh, independent set of small services. So uh, uh, so uh, what is the benefit you get uh, by designing a system uh, like that? So uh, this architecture has like many advantages in uh, several uh, aspects such as uh, maintainability, testability, and deployability. So for, an, for, for example, uh, each service in this system is relatively small, right? So it allows us to easily understand and do changes. So for developers, it's not gonna be a nightmare to do uh, a change in a, a particular service because it's small and understandable easy. And also, uh, so the, since these uh, services can be deployed independently, uh, it also provides better deployability than traditional systems. So, so now let's see, uh, let's compare those two uh, integration styles we did just discussed. So uh, in this diagram, you can see uh, in, the, in the left side, the, in the left, uh, left diagram, you can see the ESP is there. So that ESP implementation is flat. It is implemented as a single system and uh, the service A, service B, service C, they just uh, call uh, uh, they just communicate with the ESP layer. And uh, on the right side, you can see it is the microservices based architecture. So there you can see uh, that uh, the ESP layer is separated into three microservices, uh, microservices X, Y, and Z. So, uh, and uh, we have, uh, uh, like, uh, so, so actually basically those X, Y, Z microservices can be, uh, defined as uh, coarse grain microservices, right? And also the microservices uh, P, Q, and R, uh, they can be defined as fine grain microservices. So uh, what, uh, what do those coarse grain microservices do? So they basically aggregate the functionalities of 
those fine-grained uh, microservices uh, to deliver a meaningful business functionality. So uh, the earlier versions or the uh, six series of the WSO2 uh, Enterprise Integrator is specifically designed uh, adopting this bus integration architecture. So for a bus style integration, you can use uh, the six series of the WSO2 Enterprise Integrator. So however, to overcome uh, the drawbacks and the limitations of this bus architecture, as well as to uh, progress as a hybrid integration platform, the WSO2 Micro Integrator was introduced. So the latest version, uh, or the seven series of uh, the WSO2 Enterprise Integrator is uh, an um, all-in-one hybrid integration platform which adheres to the microservices architecture. So if you want to do implement a microservices architecture-based integration, you can use the WSO2 Enterprise Integrator, integrator uh, the seven series. So now let's see what are the deployment choices available today for the microservices architecture. So as many of us know, Docker is one of the most popular containerization platforms available today. Uh, the containerized architecture is uh, ideal for deploying and managing microservices due to its uh, modularized structure. Uh, managing containers manually is a hideous task. So that's why there are container orchestration services like Kubernetes. So Kubernetes is an extremely popular container orchestration service. And uh, uh, there are other orchestration platforms as well, such as Docker Swarm, but Kubernetes is the most popular uh, platform. So uh, it is a powerful tool to manage uh, clusters of microservices. Also, there are several other cloud vendors who offer managed uh, Kubernetes platforms. So having a managed Kubernetes, Kubernetes platform, you just uh, you can just get rid of the hassle of uh, configuring everything by yourself. So they do it for you. So uh, the examples, the most, most popular examples are OpenShift, AWS uh, EKS, and Azure AKS. So here, uh, uh, now let's see what uh, WSO2 EI offers uh, towards this Docker and Kubernetes uh, platform. So uh, the WSO2 Integration Studio uh, has uh, inbuilt capabilities to generate Docker images and Kubernetes configurations. So Docker projects in, my, uh, in the Integration Studio provide uh, uh, allows us to generate Docker images which are uh, micro-integrator based. Uh, Kubernetes projects in uh, the, the integration studio are designed to generate uh, Kubernetes configurations required to create micro-integrator based uh, Kubernetes clusters. Also, uh, we have the uh, EI Kubernetes operator, which provides first class, uh, first class support for uh, Kubernetes cluster deployments. So uh, that brings uh, us to the end of this webinar. Uh, to wind up the session, let me just uh, invite back my uh, colleague, Hasita. Hasita, over to you. Thank you, Delisha. Uh, today we talk about uh, like application integration in general and uh, three key areas that is related to integration hybrid integration platform, API-driven integration, and integration architectures. You can use WSO2 EI and WSO2 API Manager to implement an API-driven hybrid integration platform in any style we talked about. So there will be more uh, upcoming webinars on integration by us wso2 we would like to invite you all to join them as well now uh, it's time for questions uh, if you have any questions related to the areas we talk about today or the questions related to wso2's directions on the areas please uh, feel free to ask now So uh, there's a question on how you possibly like discuss how a sync APIs and event streams uh, fit into hybrid integration platform. 
So uh, regardless of uh, the nature of uh, the APIs, so uh, so the hybrid integration platform generally means like uh, uh, you need to integrate on-premise and uh, uh, cloud services, right? So uh, for an example, uh, you can uh, pull some data from uh, your in-house uh, message broker over to uh, after, uh, over to some uh, uh, on-prem like uh, Kafka platform deployed on cloud or uh, or some Amazon SQS service. So like that, uh, like uh, uh, so we also have. Uh, some uh, product called streaming integrator, uh, which you can uh, use to uh, communicate uh, or to combine these event streams and uh, manipulate them to deliver business values. So, so there's another question. Uh, uh, is it possible to integrate uh, Google's and uh, services to which extents? Uh, so, uh, if machine learning services has an API, I think uh, they should have. Uh, so, we can come up with an connector. So, I, I think out of the box, uh, today uh, we don't uh, have a connector uh, addressing email services specifically. However, uh, uh, we in the documentation we we have explained how you can write a custom connector extending uh, extending uh, what is there so so if you know the api you can just go ahead and write the connector so uh, in the future uh, we will uh, we have some prioritizations on the connectors uh, so we will uh, be uh, uh, connecting or developing our connectors based on those priority. So you, you anyone is welcome to uh, uh, write the connectors and uh, like contribute it to the st uh, to our connected store. Uh, there's another question uh, like how does uh, WS3 I connect between local host and Azure Cloud services. I think uh, uh, the question means how you can uh, move some uh, data on premise onto Azure Cloud services, right? So the, we have some uh, connector in our connector store called uh, uh, Azure uh, Connector. So you can Azure Store. So you can use that connector. Uh, so you can read in uh, uh, using file system, or uh, you can read the read your corporate database and get the data to WS2 EI, and then mediate it uh, using the connector onto the Azure. Are APIM and EI are to be used together, or are they some products? So when you, uh, when, when, uh, even if these are like individual products today, so when you build a, uh, a solution architecture for some some problem, so they are used together. So um, what we generally do is uh, we design the integration using the EI and expose the endpoints and. We pump those endpoints uh, using API manager and apply security monetization uh, using API manager. So in future, we might uh, come with a hybrid platform uh, with uh, API manager capabilities and EI capabilities blend together. Uh, so, uh, so that's the situation. So uh, WS2 EI and uh, WS uh, EI 7 and 6 series uh, 
like a success of WSO2 year six. However, they are two separate topics when they exist next to each other. So uh, uh, yes, they will exist uh, because uh, year six series uh, is for monolithic uh, uh, like bus style deployment and uh, year seven is for uh, microservices style. Uh, so they will uh, continue to exist uh, with each other. So there's a question uh, like how to link uh, EI to BPS. So so uh, basically EI uh, is used for like short term like uh, short term communications like uh, you uh, stateless these communications are stateless and when it comes to bps they are stateful uh, so so when you uh, link means you uh, trigger some bps process from the ei you initiate some bps process from the ei right so uh, so bps uh, when you model your workflows using uh, bps uh, you can uh, have an endpoint, uh, entry point to the flow, and that entry point uh, can be modeled as an API and be triggered from EI. So, is there a question? Uh, there's a question like Is ESB still important in microservices architecture? Uh, so basically, uh, our WSO2 uh, basically ESB as a style, it is different from my microservices architecture, right? So it's too uh, like completely different. Uh, however, like uh, you can trigger some uh, ESB, like uh, you you can integrate some conventional or like. Uh, uh, legacy systems using ESB and expose it as a endpoint and uh, call that using a microservice. So you can uh, combine them together, but uh, like architecture wise, uh, those are like different paradigms. Uh, so we have another question. For locally WSO2 EI development, uh, can I simply use my Windows 10 PC? And uh, what characteristics is uh, needed? So uh, yes, you can do that. You can use Windows 10 because uh, if you take the, the WSO2 integration studio, which you will uh, need to develop your integration flows, it is supported uh, on Windows 10. So you can basically download the Windows 10 version of it and uh, start developing integration flows. So yes, it is possible. And also uh, WSO2 EI runtime can be also started on Windows. So there's no problem that side as well. So there's a like a question like how you, uh, uh, I have developed two APIs, one in API manager and uh, the other in EI. And please tell me how, how these two APIs communicate to each other. So, uh, so as we discussed earlier, we uh, we use WS2 EI to build the integration and expose it as an API, right? And uh, and what WS2 API manager does is uh, expose it to the outside. So. So what you can do is you can uh, uh, when when you configure the endpoint uh, sorry the API in API manager you can point the API exposed from EI as the endpoint. So that is how you uh, uh, like link each other. So uh, when you expose the API from the API manager, you can uh, apply security and all those uh, value-added things. Uh, so uh, 
it is not necessary to uh, secure the communication between AEI and API manager uh, because uh, it will reside uh, within the firewall. So, uh, so that is uh, how you link the two. So that, uh, so, uh, so that's the questions we, we have. So, uh, so we will uh, meet you with another webinar, uh, like uh, uh, on WSO2 EI and uh, integration. So uh, until then, uh, thank you and goodbye. Thank you very much.